international development practitioner. Welcome to the program, Enene. Thank you very much. And Hamzat Lawal, he is the chief executive at Code. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, starting off um, immediately and very hot this morning. It's not, it's, it's not, it is no longer an issue of the present administration. It's Nigeria as a, as a country, we are quick to um, refute and ignore reports that um, show otherwise of what the present administration or any administration um, seeks to say. So is it safe to say that, that the country's human index report recently released is abysmal? I'll start from you, Mr. Hamza. Oh, no, it's not. That's the current reality that we face. You know, for people that have not traveled across Nigeria, and, and when I say travel across Nigeria, I'm talking about grassroots communities and hinterlands. Uh, for me, when I saw the report, I was not surprised. You know, I, and I think it's timely. And I believe as much as some analysts would want to question the report, we need to look at the report as an opportunity to deepen our existing infrastructure and invest more in human capital development in the country. Mm. Do you share the same uh, sentiment? Um? Um, it is abysmal, but like he said, it is our current reality. Um, and if you look at the wealth of nations, the secret of the wealth of nations is people. And for too long, we've prioritized other things apart from developing the human capital of the nation. And it reflects in what we see. Still staying with, with, with you, I want I w you are somebody you, you are somebody that is into developmental issues. What would you tag at some of the factors that have hampered significant investment in human development in the country? Um, lack of priorities, um, the resource curse, which is we've historically focused on crude, which was our main export um, product, and we weathered a lot of storms by doing that. Unfortunately, the world economy is changing. Um, globalization is hitting us hard, and um, the global oil economy has affected us. And that's making us finally have a rethink. But unfortunately, we are considering developing our human capital at a time when we've already hit crisis. And unfortunately, there's a lag between when you make investments in the human capital of a nation and when you start to reap the returns. So if you look at the report, there are three indicators for the human yes. development of any nation. One of those is access to knowledge. Yes. Another is um, healthy, a yes, healthy and healthy, long yes, life. Yes. And another is that healthy and long life, you know, standard what's, what's the living. standard of yes, living that yes. people can aspire to? And if you look at those three parameters, they're all interrelated. Um, so um, making an impact in one will have a knock-on sure. effect on the other. Sure. And um, not making an impact in one or investments in one is going to have a knock-on effect on all the others. So it's a lot of systemic constraints. And a big part of it is a failure of governance. And when I say failure of governance, I do not exclude the average citizen. Okay. Because governance um, happens from the family unit to the community unit to the regional, you know, subnational and regional governments up to the federal government. And at every stage, we have had failures of leadership and governance. Hamzat, is it too late for us to no. retrace our steps? No, it's not too late. Uh, it's not too late because and again, for us, if we see this as an opportunity, then it's not too late. But if we see it as a problem, then we would not get it right. It's not too late because if you look at the population and the demography, you know, over 60% is below 35 years old. So it means that if we're able to put in the investments that we need, particularly looking at knowledge, and, and when we talk about knowledge, we're talking about skill set. If we want to diversify our economy, we need to build capacity and transfer knowledge and build more skilled people who can drive the economy in other sector. Today, we provide lip services to agriculture, but have we actually put in the needed infrastructure, the needed financing? If you, if you interact with a regular farmer, he tells you that to access loan or credit is a problem. He tells you that to access seeds and fertilizer is a problem. So, so again, we, we as a country, if we don't get it right now, the, the world will move forward and leave us behind. The world is actually moving forward and leaving us behind. In 2050, no one would look at our crude oil. No one would want to buy crude oil. People are di by diversifying. People are actually investing in cleaner technology, cleaner energy. So the world is moving, and Nigeria must not do catch up. We need to move with the world. Today, we, we're experiencing a crisis of migration. 
a lot of young people want to leave the shores of Nigeria because they need to find greener pasture. They need to ensure that they have a longer life span. They need to ensure that they can get a job. So, so for us, we need to increase that investment deliberately. So yeah. beyond just budgeting, we need to also have special intervention. Beyond just budgeting and planning. And, and, and my sister talked about governance. So it's not about national government. I think states need to look at what resources do we have? What gaps do we have? Fill in those gaps and provide that services. Today, other clients are providing manpower. Do we have the numbers? Yes, we have the numbers. Do we have the skills? No, we don't have the skills. Can we build those skills and provide the world with the manpower? Provide the world with innovative ideas and bring about technology? Local technology would work for us. We need local technology that will meet global demands. Global demands. So and that's so that's it. Uh, uh, you, you, one thing that I, I, I love what you said is where you said that we should uh, we get, we're getting to approach. But there are two schools of thought while going through the report. There are some other analysts that said that um, the, the issue of human development is a bottom down approach should a, a bottom down approach that is from the federal government from the government down to the people but there's another school of thought that are of the view that the development and changes we need should start from the people themselves upwards i don't know what school of thought do you believe in um, I, I don't know what school of thought you feel who, who is use. government who is government the, the leaders who are the leaders it's the same people yeah. okay. it is the people we are what we the what we have as output in government is what we can afford or what capacity we have so we ourselves, we elect within ourselves and ensure that uh, some percentage represent our interests at, both at local, state, and national government. I believe it's bottom-up approach. Or if we want to do bottom-up, at least from top-bottom, we might meet an, at an even. Right. But we need to do more at the bottom, the grassroots. The grassroots level. Today, when we go to the university and come out with a certificate, does our certificate meet the current demands in the labor market? Is it about just getting a certificate or having the technical expertise to meet those demands? To, as employers of labels, we always have that crisis and challenges to fill in the gap in our organization and various institutions. And if you even go to the public sector, and, and I mean government, when you go to MDEs, I interact with people in the MDEs. They don't even have the capacity to give good output. Today, you, you, when you read letters from, from government agencies, or you even write letters to them and you get response, you, you just wonder, what kind of graduate are we having in our country today? What kind of people are we chunking out? And, and come to think of it, when we talk about uh, uh, livelihood, are we investing in healthcare? Look at our primary healthcare centers, all dilapidated across the country. And when you look at the finance, the funding that have gone into primary health care center, and you put it side by side what is obtainable on ground, we're not getting value for money. Let us do away with the norms and do away with the lip services. We have an impending crisis at our hand. I, I believe now more than ever before we should declare an emergency crisis. That's just what I, that's the question I was going to throw at, at in, in, in terms of the education and health okay. sectors of Nigeria, is it time, or has it passed, is it time we declare a state of emergency on those sectors? Because you talked about grad graduates just now, that the graduates we are churning out into the labor market, do, they don't meet the, 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 the what the employers desire. Ha do we need a state of emergency in, in those sectors? It is already a state of emergency. And it, we need a lot of reform of government, um, but we need a lot of public awareness and educating of citizens. Um, you asked if it's um, bottom up or yes. top, down. top down. It's both for us now. If you look at how most um, successful nations, you know, um, first world, like we say nations, how did they develop? They evolved over centuries. They evolved over centuries from communities, from homesteads to communities who were working collaboratively. They would provide their own sewer systems. They would provide their own security systems. They would provide their own power systems. They would farm communally. Yes. Um, that is something that we have not done historically. Our communities are still groups of smallholder farmers who are each running their own enterprise, very mini, minuscule enterprise. We fail to collaborate. And what is the reason? It is mostly an issue of trust. 
it is a lack of trust, believing because if you do anything communally, we all know there will always be freeloaders. There will be people who do not want to contribute but who want to benefit. And how do you deal with that? So you need trust that this communal endeavor is going to work or community endeavor will work, um, at least some level of trust. And then you need the other thing that will support it, which is um, a rule of law, um, a recourse, a way that you can get recourse when people do not. Because we have not collaborated historically over the centuries, we never developed those systems to make sure those things were in place. So up till today, um, the average Nigerian who has the means creates their own power, provides their own security, does their own sanitation. We are all mini governments. It does not make sense to do that. Economies of scale tell us that. And these are educated Nigerians. We all know that Nigerians can be great individually in every sphere of endeavor. And like um, Hamzat said, you know, there's mass emigration. Um, people who can afford to leave are leaving. Unfortunately, most of the people who can afford to leave are the people whose sacrifices would impact the growth and development of this country. So what do we need? We need heart. We need soul. We need spirit beyond technical ability, beyond um, financial needs. We need people who care about this country. We're talking about human development and for a nation as wealthy in resources as Nigeria is and for a nation at the level of leadership that Nigeria is in Africa, we are 157 out of 188. That's abysmal. Yes. That's a state of emergency. Yes. Um, do the political elite think that? Um, I'll leave you to, to, to okay, ponder that. Okay, I think I have to bring Hamzat in here now. We, we have seen the political process of Nigeria being commercialized. We have a lot of money politics going on in the society. How do we just oppose that to the fact that Nigeria is currently the poverty capital of the world? Do you think our leaders are blind to these things? Oh, no, they're not. You know what is happening now is benefiting some people. Mm -hmm. the yes, it is. Mm -hmm. The fact that over 50% of our population live below poverty line. And if you look at the report, over 52% of yes. people yes. are yeah. very Extremely poor. poor yes. so, so a lot of people are, are banking on this. And, and this is affecting our polity. Today is now about vote buying and vote selling. Commercializing the, the democratic process. process. And now the, electo the electioneering process is being hampered on. So, so it tells you that it's... It it's the human development index. People cannot even think for themselves anymore. People are saying, let us enjoy the dividends of democracy at the polling booth and, and pay me for my vote so, because I don't get to see you after four years. People can't think. Come to think of it, it it's really quite sad and appalling because it's just as if that a few people are now weaponizing poverty. Mm. Yeah. If you don't know something, then anyone who come and trample on your right will definitely go away with it because you don't that's even right. have information or knowledge about your right. So, so that's where we are currently, where some few people are looting our collective resources to keep us where we are. And we ha it has to be a deliberate attempt. My sister talked about we need spirit, we need soul. It's about patriotism. We're talking about Nigeria. In the next five years, if we don't do anything, we would not sit down like this and talk. Because there's a saying that when the poor don't have what to eat, they will start eating yes. the rich. Today, if you look at our security problem, it's about the human capital index. There's so much pressure on our security architecture. Why? Because there are no jobs. So now you have social vices. Look at the northeastern region. And again, there's a factor. There's an environmental factor. There's that natural factor. You cannot take it take away the e effect of climate change. Before now, the Lake Chad region is an economic boom, where you have fishermen, you have young people, you have women selling. But now when you go there, over 60% of the Lake Chad is gone. Okay, before, before we go on, let's quickly take this short moment, then you continue. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back.
All right, welcome back. We still, our conversation is still starting and it's still ongoing, or actually. You can join the conversation through our social media platforms at Twitter at Moneyline AIT. Um, you can also get the recap on Moneyline Witness at YouTube. So, bef okay, just before the break, I was about asking, apart from life expectancy, education and per capita income indicators, what else do you think we're failing? And let me start from you, Nene. Sorry? Uh, apart from life expectancy, education and per capita income, what else do you think we're failing that will push the, these indicators up? And that um, I would say that those are the main ones for human development. However, there's something that we need that will support growth in any of those sectors. And that's um, systems. We, say, we talk about institutions, we talk about systems, um, but I would like to talk of more of networks. Networks for collaboration so that government doesn't have to do everything. The government doesn't have to provide all the infrastructure and all the support. between the private and public sector? Between the private and okay. the public sector, um, among private citizens, okay. um, within communities, um, at the subnational level, at the regional level, mm -hmm. those kinds of PPPs, you know, those kinds of arrangements, so that every sector of the society can be productive at its own level. That's something that we need um, because the, the, the gaps, the, the, the need is too great to be filled by the government that we have right now. Um, our public sector is struggling to provide um, um, yes, services so provide um, to services. citizens. Um, they need support themselves. If you've ever worked with any government um, agency, you, you see the, the capacity gaps, the capability gaps. You see the, the lack of incentives for them to actually get a job done. You see how their, their working environment negatively impacts even their desire and their motivation to do a good job. Um, during the break, we're talking about the, the SIPs, yes. the, the social investment programs of this administration, for which I have provided some technical support. Okay. And a big factor with the delivery of a lot of, a lot of these programs is how do we get, it's logistics, how do we get these loans, how do we get this um, support to the people who need it the most? Not the people in Abuja, not the people in Lagos, but the people in the hinterlands uh, of Nigeria, in rural areas, um, who are the ones in most need. Um, what, what are the logistics to get it to them? And um, it's a lot of questions and not many answers. I know, Hamzat, you do a lot of work in the grassroots. Now, I'm talking about the social investment programs of the federal government. Would you say, would you say the impact is being felt at the grassroots level? You know, well, honestly speaking, particularly around the um, 10,000, 10,000, 5,000 given to rural poor people. Trade the money? Yes. Okay. No, not the trade money. Conditional cash, 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 cash transfer. Yes, the okay, conditional cash, 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 okay. cash transfer. Visiting various communities and interacting with some beneficiaries. This is actually impacting their lives. Mm -hmm. so I met with a 70-year-old woman in Anambra State, and, and she told me that she's a widow. She has no children and, um, and that she has diabetes. And if not for this 5,000 naira that helps her get food and her supplements, she would have been dead by now. So there's that impact. And, and even the enrollment process we're involved in Nasara State, uh, just to ensure that we are uh, able to inform the general public that this is actually happening. But then it's only the federal government that have safety net program. What about state and local government? See, if you look at our budget system, the local government has a budget passed, yes. running into billion. The state government have budget. their budget, oh, yeah. some running into trillions. And we have our national budget. But everyone is focused on the national budget. No one looks at the local government budget in the state. And what interventions are states and local authorities giving to the people? Development comes directly from the local authorities. Yes. It's only special intervention that the federal government can provide. And besides Nigeria, we have 36 states on the FCT. I think we need to collaborate more and look at what are the strengths in the region? What are the resources we have? And this is where data will play a role. We have a lot of data. I think we need to disaggregate this data and leverage on the powers of this data to inform our policy and decision making. But most importantly, let's have an enabling environment. You know, we talked about the private sector, the public sector. We also have multinationals who are making trillions of dollars from Nigeria who are IOCs yes. helping export our crude. So I think we also need to deepen those collaboration and strengthen institution so that we would not have corrupt practices and people would not just come and make money out of Nigeria. Nigeria is actually a venturous country where that you can have 
I think here in Nigeria we have most successful businesses here. Whatever business you do would strive. The only problem is those institutional bottleneck that would that, that, that would hamper you to really make much more profit and invest more in the system. So so for me, all the opportunities are here. And as much as we talk about Nigeria, it also affects other African countries. Today the African Union is talking about the Vision 2063 agenda. Yeah. You know, the United Nations is talking about the uh, 2030 agenda that is sustainable development, development goal. goals. And for Africa to achieve these visions and goals, Nigeria must prosper. Because if Nigeria does not prosper, it would affect other African countries. And the world would not be able to survive it. Where do you want to take close to 200 million people mm -hmm. to with this crisis today? Where would we yeah. go to? Is it Ghana? Is it Togo? Is it Cameroon? They can't take us. So we must see this not as a government problem, but as our own problem. And it's not just a problem or challenge. It's an opportunity for us to bring our ideas, to bring our skills and knowledge to the table and say, we need to get it right. And we need to fix this, this, and this. And mind you, this is long term. So yes. we need to have a framework, a roadmap, or a plan, a clear-cut plan embraced by everyone so that we have we build confidence with the private sector. And they can now bring finance. You know, we have multinational corporation and bring technology transfer. And government provide that enabling environment, legal and regulatory framework, and institutions that strengthen. And then Nigeria can be proud, and all the people that have left the country will come back. Okay. Um, um, just before then, you made mention of SDG goals. Is the, I would want to ask on a passive and as well to know, among all the SDG goals that, are, that we are targeting, is there anyone that you can give a 50% pass mark that Nigeria has achieved? Well, the SDG started in 2015. Okay. And we have 17 goals. Yes. I think for us, we just need to prioritize what goals affect us the most, okay. which for me is healthcare, basic education, okay. access to water, sanitation, and hygiene, and creating decent employment for and young healthcare. people, you know, creating uh, and meeting Nigeria's energy needs. Because if you don't meet energy needs, then there will be that gap. So if for us, we just need to prioritize our goals. Some states are leading in this process. You know, Kaduna City is doing quite yes, well. Uh, and and there's, that, there's that enthusiasm in the area of government wanting to popularize the goal, localize the goal, and have people take ownership. But mind you, we must, it is a must, we must meet it. And, and it beckons on citizens to continue to hold government to account. Beyond just electing people into public office will not cut it. You need to continue holding government to account, and it's our sole responsibility. Yes. Well, yes. And before you get in, before you get to answer the same question about the SDG goals, let's quickly listen to what Nigerians are saying on the state of the economy. It's trying to improve the economy of the country so that it can compete with the developed countries, so that Nigeria will get out from developing country to developed country. But because of uh, selfish interests and corruption that overshadows us, we're supposed to put our country first in our mind, not our personal benefit, but our collective benefit. This sort of Nigeria economy is in a bad state. And uh, the, our politicians are not ready to do anything. What they are all concerned now is returning back to that same office they are now. Well, there are certain things that needs to be done while they left it out. Couldn't, to me, they couldn't meet up. In Nigeria now, it's like you are struggling, you are struggling for yourself. Why we have a government, the father of all, so that you can we fight for you fight for water, to get water, electricity, even education. It's by choice, so because there's many people are there that uh, wanted to do Nigeria better, but they couldn't get there. But secondly, what I thought that is killing Nigeria is this. If you are, for example, you read a message in the school, you not get an appointment in another uh, organization. You can't cook because it's not your feet. That is what kills Nigerian leaders. It's hard. That's what I'm saying in general. It's th things are hard. The transportation, the feeding, and then even the money to pay school fees to children, uh, it's hard. 
Anyway, the government has not forgotten their citizens just because of the way the uh, economic. Actually, the politicians are they are, are cause of the problem. What is happening to Nigeria? So, as for the economy, as you can see, everybody is crying and asking for one thing or the other. As a kind of hunger everywhere. So, but that's not is in their hand. They can do it. Whatever thing the government have to do, they should do it. ASAP. Because the economy as it is right now is crashing. But whatever thing the government wants to do, they should put politics aside. We voted for them. This is election era. They'll be making different promises and all that. So we voted for them. So whatever thing they want to do that will affect the life of citizens positively, they should try to do it. Really, the state of the country now, we are all concerned. And then there's nothing the, the economy can do until the politics is really OK. I, I, I think we should do uh, politics in a mature way and in a the professional way. Because it, it, the way it, it is going now, uh, we giving the people that are supposed to vote with their own conscience, we are giving them money and then we know that they are seeing some of the, the part of the economy that are not yet being paid the salary. I don't think it, it should be done that way. Let us give the people the, the grace to vote with their own conscience. And then what we're after is that we want a good leader. That's what we're after. You've heard the reactions from Nigerians. Um, it, it still boils down to what you said, um, Hamza, about um, separating politics. You can't separate politics from the economy and also the issue of vote buying. But and they, just before the break, and then I was about to answer the question on SDG goals. Which one have, can you see we have achieved so far? At, the, at least a 50%. Henry, I don't think we should be saying that we've achieved. To be honest, I don't think we've achieved any at a 50% rate as it is. However, we have quite some time to go before, you know, the goals, yes. the goals. So what should we be doing now? We should be tracking. We should be tracking implementation. We should have plans in place. And um, I'm aware that Kaduna State is the first subnational government to actually release a report on how much they've implemented in the SDGs. And when I say first subnational government, that's globally, globally yes. right? Um, so Nigeria is, is doing some good things. Other states can learn from, from, from a state like Kaduna. But then it's to put plans in place and to track implementation of those plans. Still staying with you, in, of course, in the UNDP report, 34 states and the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja recorded decline in the UNDP's education index. And we just had two states recording an upward trajectory. We have, we have Borno and Jigawa. Now, you, have, you said the education sector, is, uh, there's already a state of emergency happening there right now. We're talking about teachers' welfare, remuneration, even the quality of what is being taught to, this, to the students. How can we scale up development in the education sector significantly? Um, there's a lot that can be done to scale that up, but let's reflect on why we need to do that. Um, Nigeria had a very good head start in terms of other African countries in terms of education. And that is, I would say that the attribution for a lot of the strengths of Nigeria as a population came from how much education we got in the colonial times and up to you know, early independence. The, 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 the amount of learning um, that our people imbibed and the amount of um, self-determination that gave Nigerians. In almost every sphere, we have broken you know, records. Um, why? What, does what is it about education? Because it's not actually going to school that is the issue. As we can see now, because when the quality of learning drops in schools, the quality of instruction, the quality of the environment, and um, even the children's well-being before they ever come to school drops, school attendance doesn't make much impact on their um, productivity. Yes. So the issue is how much learning is going on and what is it about learning? It gives people tools to reflect on their condition and to you know, determine how they want to take their life forward. In fact, with a little bit of education, a person can learn almost any skill without going to a classroom. Um, my father, for example, is a professor today he never attended secondary school. After primary school, he did correspondence courses, um, eventually got into the university, and became a professor. So that is what education does. It gives you your life for you to take charge of that. And that takes a lot of weight and responsibility of government. Yes. With, a little b with, with solid, basic education, 
which is the first nine years, so primary school and the first three years of primary school, it's enough. If that education is at a high level and is, is quality education, then individuals can take their lives forward. They, they can learn vocational skills, they can learn even academic skills, and they can be functioning, productive members of society. So that's why education should be prioritized as one of the goals for any administration considering how poorly we are doing because that takes a lot of the strain of the responsibility of government to lead people because you're like driving people rather than leading people. And that's where we are now. Too many people are too poor, struggling with basic survival, not educated enough to take their lives into their hands and government is some parts of government are taking advantage of that, and for some it just becomes a huge weight on our shoulders. What do you have to say about the, uh, the education sector moving forward? How do you think we, sh we should be involved? Because I remember that she made mention of, um, I think the curriculum that we are having now is a, is a bit fair, but your dad being a professor without having corresponding education is based on the fact that then it was good. So where did we go wrong, and what should be done? Um, you know, our parents had it all good good for them you know even when you talk about the school feeding pr program back in the days the chicken our parents ate is even bigger than what they're serving now but when we talk about education we need to also ensure that we we, we broaden it it's both um formal and informal education yes. because today the literacy rate in the country is quite high uh, and 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 you see interestingly when you look at the universal basic education and how we have fed a lot of state have not been able to access their own parts. Why? Because they've not been able to provide counterpart funding. And you know, interestingly, Bruno states that have been ravaged with the insurgents is the state that is doing most. They're doing very well accessing the UBE and even implementing the universal basic education mm -hmm. in their state. I just came back from uh, um, uh, Bruno visiting various rural communities, and it's quite exciting that if Bruno state can go far, then other state needs to go and learn. And that's one thing we don't do, knowledge mm -hmm. management. Mm -hmm. you, states mm -hmm. should you know, put away their egos and go and learn how these people are getting it right. And, and staying on universal basic education, the foundation of a child is very important. Mm -hmm. Today we're where we are because of our foundation. And you know, my sister talked about household governance. Are we ensuring that children take breast milk when they're, ch when they're small? Because this counts, it helps develop the mind of the child. Mindset. And then, do we ensure that they get that basic education, the first six years, you know, the basic secondary school, first three years? The UBA Act talked about free education for nine years. Are education really free in Nigeria? No. Do we have quality yeah. education? Now there's the, the amendments and the National Assembly, the UBA, the, the Amend UBA Act, and that campaign which we're running in collaboration with other civil society. Since July 2017, the Senate have passed this bill. But the House of Representatives is yet to pass this important legislation that hopes to increase basic education from nine years to 12 years compulsory and free. And if you understand how it works, it has to be passed by both parliament, harmonized and sent for presidential assent. And we have confidence that Mr. President will sign it just to show that he has commitment towards education. But if it's not passed, he can't sign something that something has not been not passed. passed. So, but now we're, we're in an electioneering campaign season. And, and I'm worried. The National Assembly is supposed to be conveyed today, but the reports that they're not opening up uh, or reconvening today. So it's worrisome, and it shows that lack of seriousness. Again, the Minister of Education made an announcement a while back that very soon he would declare a state of emergency in the education sector. I, I'm still wondering when would that happen, when we're already experiencing a national disaster yeah. on the educational sector. But I believe there is still hope. There is hope because when we talk about Vision 2020 of Nigeria, which we, we've definitely not achieved, and we talk about the SDG goals, in the next 30 years, you know, we ask ourselves as young people, where would we be? Some of our colleagues would be in the hands of affairs. And I think now, more than ever before, is to invest more in these people so that we don't have that cycle of crisis when some of my colleagues are in the hands of affairs in the country. Because it must be deliberate. Build skills, build capacity, invest more. And so that the next generation afterwards will do better than what we have today. But definitely our parents got it wrong. You've, and then I want to bring you in here now. Do you think in Nigeria, in terms of administration, we have the wrong people in the wrong positions? I'm coming from the 
key key sectors that have to do with youth that have to do with development like education ICT we are not seeing the much needed development in those sectors do we have the wrong people manning those positions um, very good question and so you're saying do we have you know wrong fit you know have square pegs in round yes. holes yes. absolutely we do and that is a symptom of a larger problem which is part of what we talk ab talk about where are the opportunities how many people pursue a vocation in life because that is where they believe their strengths and their abilities lie it's we're not in a place where people are choosing a vocation based on that and so people take a job there's a government job take the job um, it's administration I'm more of a field person you still take the job um, I worked in Kaduna State in reviewing the reforms from 2015 to date and a lot of the reforms were in the education sector like you the press would know and have reported now um, one of the things that kept coming up from head teachers and parents etc was that a lot of um, teachers it's just, okay, there's a, there's, there's a government, you don't have a job, you're unemployed, go and be a teacher. That's the next thing they tell you. They can't tell you go and be a doctor, it's go and be a teacher. And so we look down on certain roles, you know, any junior um, government position. A lot of um, public servants were retrenched in, in, in Kaduna State. And this was because of that kind of wrong fit and people not having the, the values and the purpose of driving um, the public sector but taking the jobs for the sake of having a job. Do you want to add something to that? Oh, see, there's some things that are not rocket science. And though we don't have silver bullets to all the solutions, but when you look at the ICT sector, and you know, interestingly, let's look at who is manning the ICT sector in Kenya. Today in Sub-Sahara Africa, Kenya is striving in ICT. They're doing very well terms of investment, infrastructure, and, and mobilizing young people to leverage on the opportunities of life city. But let's look at our, our home country. Let's not do lip service and sugarcoat. Let's yeah. look at our own That's country. Because again, there are sectors that you must get technocrats. You must get experienced, knowledgeable technocrats to lead. Because these are quite important to the growth and development of the country. And now, ICT is the one creating jobs in other climes. That's true. So, so why? I, I believe that if truly we want to move this country forward, honestly, we have all the answers and all the solutions. The, the, indeed, we have all the answers, but we can't give all the answers today as um, we are running short already. But, but it is quite true. And thank you so much, um, Hamza Lawal and Nene Jambi, for coming, for gracing the occasion for us to discuss this. It has been, it is already a national discourse. And thank you so much for joining us to discuss this. Thank you so well, much for having much, me. Yeah. But that's the much you can take today on the show. Yes, that's where we draw the curtains on today's program. Thank you for being there with us. Thank you for investing your, your time with us. Join us same time, same station for another edition of the program. I am Christiana Amadou. Bye for now. And I'm Henry Isumchi. The news is up next.